Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the White House. I'm Alondra Nelson, a Deputy Assistant to the President and Principal Deputy Director for Science and Society at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. It is inspiring to look across this room at this brilliant group of leaders and advocates of innovators assembled for this first ever summit at the White House on STEM equity and excellence. On behalf of the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Biden-Harris administration, we are thrilled that you've joined us today um, and grateful to you for um, those who are joining us in person and those of you who are joining us uh, around the country and across the world on the live stream. This moment today marks a turning point for the American science and technology ecosystem. Never in our nation's history has there been a coordinated national effort toward achieving equity, spurring excellence, and dramatically expanding opportunity in our fields of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine, STEM. For generations, American science and technology leadership has been, has driven extraordinary change and improved people's lives across the world. And yet, our STEM ecosystem remains inequitable by many meaningful measures, shutting out and diverting away too many talented individuals, closing off opportunities for discovery and innovation, and ultimately limiting our national potential. People of color, rural communities, women, people with disabilities, LGBTQ people have long navigated the STEM fields at a structural disadvantage. President Biden and Vice President Harris are committed to knocking down systemic barriers to participation in STEM and ensuring that all the American public can contribute to and benefit from science, technology, and innovation. So today, we are elated to announce a, new slate of, a slate of new actions we are taking. First, we're putting forward a vision for transforming the American STEM ecosystem, which lays out five core challenges standing in the way of full equity and excellence, and five actions for concerted national multi-sector action. Second, we're unveiling a transformative slate of actions across these five action areas from government and from philanthropy, industry, education, research and community organizations totaling more than $1.2 billion in work, investments, and opportunities in STEM across every region of the United States. And to drive this work forward into the future, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, with support from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and over 90 partner organizations are launching the STEM Opportunity Alliance a new landmark national initiative to advance American global leadership by achieving equity across STEM. Today, we'll hear from a diverse and dynamic group of leaders as we celebrate these milestones and engage in the process of sustaining this work across sectors nationally in a coordinated fashion well into the future. To begin our program, I'm honored to introduce my boss, the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and Chief Science and Technology Advisor to President Biden, the great Dr. Arthi Prabhakar. Arthi. Thank you, Dr. Alondra Nelson, for this amazing effort that you've put together and for that wonderful introduction. Um, I walked in the room and, you know, the, the rafters were shaking. There's a lot of energy here, and I think it's really good news. Uh, I want to just make a couple of comments because we are here for two very big reasons, uh, and they are the reasons that STEM really matters. Number one is we can't get the country's work done if we don't mobilize a lot more people uh, to get going in STEM careers. Um, you know, think about how technology has seeped into every aspect of our lives. Part of what that means is that the nature of work has changed in some pretty important and some pretty fundamental ways. Um, it, I think we're used to thinking of STEM jobs as jobs like, you know, maybe someone with an MD or an epidemiologist, uh, someone who's an engineer or a mathematician, maybe a data scientist. Those are definitely STEM jobs. Um, but here's some other things that are STEM jobs today. Think about aircraft mechanics or uh, technicians who work on cars, or think about the people who repair AV equipment or people who operate construction equipment. Those didn't used to be STEM jobs, as thought of as STEM jobs, and they are STEM jobs now. Think about a dental hygienist, or think about a paramedic, or think about people involved in forestry or hazardous waste cleanup. Uh, these are all jobs that require STEM skills. Now, not all of them require four-year college degrees, but they all require STEM skills. And I think that it starts to show you how 
broad the reach now is of STEM jobs. So that's what's happening to the nature of work, but we're actually not keeping pace with the demand of the science and tech jobs, the STEM jobs that are, that are coming down the pike. Uh, NSF, Ponch is here, NSF does a lot of good work to project uh, what kinds of STEM jobs we're gonna need. Their projections are that by 2026, STEM jobs will grow by 13% in an economy in which overall employment is supposed to grow about 7% in those, in those few years. So that really tells you uh, how rapid the growth is. Uh, and the uh, NSF also estimates, uh, they took a look at what it would take for, by 2030, for our uh, STEM workforce to reflect the demographics of our society. And if we were to get there by 2030, what that would mean is that the number of women in those jobs would need to nearly double, the number of black people would need to more than double, and the number of Hispanic people would need to triple. And I think that, you know, the, people talk about those as the missing millions, the people who have these enormous contributions to make, but who can't yet find pathways uh, into STEM jobs. And, and that is the second reason. So if the first reason is we have to have STEM people to be able to do the work that we need in our country, the other reason is actually even more foundational, uh, and that is about opportunity for every person in this country. Because you know, somewhere there's a mom who's in a dead-end job and she can't figure out how she's gonna take care of her family. And somewhere there's a kid who grew up in, a, in, in an environment where they don't know anyone who uses math at work. Uh, and there's a guy who sees other people getting ahead and he can't figure out how to change that. Somewhere there's a transgender kid who's not really sure that they are welcome in the STEM community. And these are the people that we need to unleash to do the country's work, but also because this is the most fundamental idea that there could possibly be, that every single person deserves an opportunity, a place, a, a way to, to sing their song and make their contribution. And that is why I'm so excited to see all of you here and the work that is, that's been germinating but now is mobilizing uh, to reach those individuals and to start turning around um, this, this situation that we have, uh, solve some big problems and empower a lot of people. So thanks very much for your work. And it's my great privilege now to introduce one of my colleagues, uh, Brian Deese, who is the director of our National Economic Council. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, uh, thank you, Arthi, and thank you, Alondra, for your dynamic uh, and incredible leadership at OSTP. One of the reasons why uh, the room feels like it's full of energy and is shaking is because of your leadership, so thank you for that. And it is great, uh, great to be here. Um, as, as Arthi said, I'm here as the director of the National Economic Council, and I wanna spend just a couple of minutes on the front end of this conversation today talking about the ways in which uh, STEM and equity in STEM is core to our economic strategy. Um, we talk a lot about economic strategy and we've been through a complicated last couple of years, but if you wanna look at the core of what President Biden is trying to do, it's a relatively simple strategy, which is to revive the basic American notion that strategic public investments are essential to achieving the full potential of our nation's economy. And we know because we've seen it throughout our history that government, industry, labor, working together in partnership can unlock extraordinary economic potential. And by doing so, we can create durable economic opportunity for families and communities. We refer to this often as a modern American industrial strategy. But there is a challenge, and we have to name that challenge, which is that prior economic transformations in the United States have not brought everybody along and persistent disparities in educational attainment, wages, and wealth are a reminder that we must do it different this time. This is not only the right thing to do. As Arthi said, it's an economically wise thing to do. Unequal economic outcomes act as a drag on economic growth. A growing body of academic literature has borne out this point over the last decade. But particularly at a moment where our economy, our global economy is constrained on the supply side, we also know that if we prioritize racial and gender equity, we invest in all of America, including geographies that have suffered from decades of deindustrialization, we actually can unlock more of our economy's full productive potential and position the United States to take full advantage of this strategy. So that's the strategy. Strategies are great but you also need to deliver. 
And so for the past year and a half, we have been focused on passing legislation that can undergird this strategy. The American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. I have said the names of the bills. We don't have to say them anymore. <laughs> One thing that this strategy has done, which I don't want to move over too quickly, it has driven the strongest and most equitable economic recovery in modern American history. The black unemployment rate has fallen from 9.2% to 5.7% over the last 18 months. The Hispanic unemployment rate has fallen from 8.6% to 3.9%. Both of those are the fastest rates of decline in unemployment in history. We have a strong momentum in our labor market that is pulling more people off the sidelines and into the game. And now, as we're building on this recovery, these laws give us the potential to actually do a historic industrial strategy. We are making an innovation investment that is larger than the Apollo pro uh, project that took us to the moon. We are making, we've made a commitment to an R&D investment that is larger than anything we've done as a nation. Now we've got to deliver on it. And we're also making an investment to connect all Americans to the digital economy with high-speed internet in a way that rivals what we did to access electrification uh, for this country more than a century ago. And through each of these investments, our commitment is to invest in STEM education and training at schools and universities nationwide, as well as on the job training like registered apprenticeship, to build a skilled and diverse workforce. And the demand for these jobs, in part because of this strategy, is so great that we can only meet it by tapping the full potential of our labor force. And we know there are millions of Americans who are systematically uh, left out of the STEM workforce, we see that in the statistics that you all are well familiar of, but black and Latino workers make up 23% of the STEM workforce. Women comprise 34% of the STEM workforce. Both of those levels are way below the share in the non-STEM workforce. These disparities start in our education system. You know these statistics, but it is striking to remind ourselves. In 2018, 4.2% of the 130,000 engineering bachelor degrees in America were given to black students. Women got one in five of those degrees. This is personal for all of us. My mother, five decades ago, got an engineering degree and was one of two out of 250 in her graduating class, only a couple of years after women had been allowed to enter the program. She was pregnant with my sister at the time. Three decades later, my sister got a physics PhD as one of only two uh, people in her graduating class. We have to do better. We've been talking about this for decades. We have to do better. We know that innovation is a team game. We can't win with so many Americans on the bench. So here's what we're going to try to do as part of this industrial strategy. First, we have to make sure that every American worker has an opportunity to train for and fill the tens of thousands of new jobs that are gonna be opened up by our investment in semiconductors. These are jobs spanning scientists, engineers, technicians, but also construction and facility operators. We just saw the potential last week when we went out to Phoenix to see the TSMC fab uh, that is breaking ground there. The president has seen this in Syracuse, New York, in Columbus, Ohio, just down uh, outside of this area in Manassas, Virginia. It's going to happen all around the country. We need to make sure every uh, American has an opportunity to train for those jobs. Our investments and our partnerships are going to be key. The NSF is going to take a historic $200 million, for example, and focus on partnerships with community colleges, technical colleges, HBCUs, other minority-serving institutions. Second, and I know that John will talk about this, we need to make sure that clean energy companies who receive federal support are investing in registered apprenticeship opportunities and paying their workers a prevailing wage and opening the doors of the clean energy revolution to all Americans. We have the tools to do this, including, for example, environmental justice grants that we can invest in a workforce to reduce greenhouse gases in those communities that have been most disproportionately harmed. And third, we need to build an infrastructure workforce that looks like America. Most of the jobs in infrastructure are not the traditional stereotype of infrastructure jobs. There are jobs that are highly technical, don't often require a college degree, but require some training in STEM fields. We have the resources to now connect people in underserved communities with the training they need to get into highly skilled, often unionized jobs that can have career ladders in sectors like telecommunications. 
And across all these investments, we as a government are making a commitment to advance equity in STEM R&D, create job pipelines for individuals who've been historically left out of the STEM workforce, and invest in the education to inspire and prepare students for these in high demand STEM sectors, particularly those who come from un underserved and un underrepresented communities. So I just wanna close by reinforcing, if, you, if there's not, nothing else you take away, this is the right thing to do for our country, but it is absolutely essential for our economy. We cannot actually have a durable economic recovery. We cannot actually effectuate a modern industrial strategy without doing this. And it's why I'm so thrilled to be here and see so many of you all stepping up and making commitments yourself. I hope that this convening generates more of these type of commitments. And I hope that we all can walk away from this recognizing that in this age that is defined by technological advancement and scientific advancement, we actually can deliver sustainable solutions for the next generation, but it is only possible if we actually do this together and, and, and benefit all of Americans. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for the commitments that you have yet to make, but you will make. Uh, and I hope that you have a very successful summit. Thank you. <laughs> And now I'm going to turn uh, the floor to uh, my uh, partner and colleague and friend and our leader on uh, everything clean energy. I couldn't actually tell you his title if I remembered it, but he just does all of our clean energy work, John Podesta. Thank you, Brian. Um, and you might stump me if I had to remember my title, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Prevacher, uh, Dr. Nelson, thanks for inviting me to be with you. It's great to be with all of you here today. Uh, Brian really laid out why uh, STEM equity and excellence is central to our economic strategy, but it should be obvious it's also critical to our climate strategy. And make no mistake, President Biden and Vice President Harris are serious about tackling the climate crisis with the urgency it demands by building a clean energy economy and creating millions of good paying jobs. Our success in accomplishing that mission depends on our ability to innovate. And underpinning that are the people who make innovation happen every day, our STEM workforce. Uh, t take uh, one example, solar, uh, solar power in this country. Thanks to the engineers who develop more efficient solar panels, and the policy and design experts who streamline permitting, the cost uh, of solar is less than one-fifth of what it was a decade ago. It's a big reason why solar sets installation records every year in the United States and all across the world. In order to meet President Biden's climate goals, we need to replicate solar success story across a huge range of clean technologies in power, in transportation, in industry, and in buildings. We need to deploy the technologies that are ready to take the stage while lowering co costs and speeding commercializations for the ones waiting in the wings. And our scientists, engineers, modelers, skilled technicians, and innovators working at our national labs, at our universities, in industries, and businesses are vital to that effort. But right now, uh, as Brian and, uh, uh, noted, our STEM workforce is missing key talent. Women only hold one-third of STEM jobs in this country. Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans are clearly underrepresented. It's unacceptable, and it means we're limiting our ability to accomplish our innovation goals and meet the climate challenge. So this president and this administration have made it a top priority to grow the STEM workforce and to make it look like America so we could put our nation's full talents behind this critical mission. It's why we've prioritized investments in our STEM workforce uh, throughout President Biden's climate agenda. This summer, the White House launched the Talent Pipeline Challenge, an initiative to fill high-quality jobs that will help rebuild our infrastructure and supply chains here at home. The announcements being made today are supercharging uh, that effort. Uh, the Chips and Science Act, uh, Brian told me never to mention these things, but he knew, he knew he would, he would, that would not be true. Strengthens the pipeline into scientific careers by authorizing new investments in STEM education and new initiatives to support HBCUs and other minority-serving institutions. 
The law also gives agencies and institutions more tools to combine sexual and gender-based harassment in the sciences, which has been a barrier for too many Americans. The Inflation Reduction Act, more than $1.5 billion uh, in critical infrastructure at our national labs, making them even more attractive for students and faculty from diverse backgrounds to get additional training. And both the IRA and the bipartisan infrastructure law create incredible opportunities to grow the clean energy workforce. The tax credits, as Brian mentioned in the IRA, uh, uh, are five times more generous for project developers that pay their workforce prevailing wages and use registered apprenticeships. We're talking about high-skilled, good jobs, but it's worth noting that 75% of the clean energy jobs created by both laws don't require a college or professional degree. These investments are important, as are the announcements being made today, uh, as Dr. Nelson pointed out. But they're just the beginning. We need more action across government, industry, labor, and philanthropy to help Americans of all backgrounds break into STEM fields and make sure they're supported throughout their careers. Because our ability to tackle the climate crisis, to boost our global competitiveness, and to build a clean, equitable, and sustainable economy of the future rests in, their, in those hands, in the STEM workforce of the future. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thank you for the announcements being made. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you here today. And now I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Nelson. Okay, so that was a galvanizing start. Let's go, people, let's go. Um, thank you so much, John. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Arthi, for um, your remarks that really laid out the stakes of, of, of what's happening in this moment and also the opportunities and the possibilities for what we can scale and supercharge, to use John's words, in this moment. Um, uh, to ensure that the administration's historic new investments in science and technology that have been laid out here this morning will serve to dramatically expand access and opportunity and power a more just and inclusive science and technology ecosystem now and into the future. So a special treat for us, I'm now pleased to welcome remarks from an American institution, a personal hero to so many of us, and a leader who has helped shape so many of the critical pieces of legislation that have been mentioned already this morning. Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. <laughs> Congresswoman Johnson is serving her 15th term representing the 30th Congressional District of Texas. She is the first African American and first woman to chair the House Committee on Science, Space, Technology, and was the first registered nurse elected to the US Congress. Congresswoman Johnson has been a lifelong champion of STEM equity and excellence and a powerful advocate for making sure that marginalized and, excluding, and excluded people can benefit from and contribute to science and technology fields. So let's hear from Congresswoman Johnson now. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson Chair of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Thank you for the opportunity to join today's summit. Creating diversity in the sciences has been a top priority throughout my time in public office. We're here today because we recognize that it is past time to create a STEM workforce that represents the rich diversity of our nation. As you all know, President Biden recently signed the Chips and Science Act into law. I was proud to help lead this effort in the House. Chips and Science is a result of more than a decade of work on solving inequities in STEM education and research. The bill con contains provisions that will break down barriers and create opportunities in STEM for all. It will advance a government-wide approach to make sure federally funded research environments foster a safe workplace. And it will empower HBCUs and MSIs to reach their full potential in STEM. These are promising policies that we can always do more. I look forward to learning from the thoughtful discussion we will have today. And I thank you. Thank you, 
Congresswoman Johnson, it is a pleasure and an honor to have these inspiring remarks as the summit gets underway. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nafisa Owens, and I'm the Assistant Director for STEM Education and Workforce at OSTP. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sith Turaman Panchanathan. Dr. Panchanathan is the 15th Director of the United States National Science Foundation, which is an $8.8 .8 billion independent federal agency that is charged with advancing all fields of scientific discovery, technological innovation, and STEM education. Dr. Panthananchan is also a computer scientist and engineer, a leader in science, engineering, and education with more than three decades of experience. He has a distinguished career in both higher education and government, where he has designed and built knowledge enterprises, which have advanced research innovation, strategic partnerships, entrepreneurship, global development, and economic growth. As director, he maintains leadership roles on several key interagency councils and committees, such as co-chair of the National Advisory Council of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, co-chair, co-vice chair of the Council for Inclusive Innovation, and co-chair for the Committee on STEM Education. Panch? The mic is yours. Good morning to all of you, and thank you, Nafisa, for introducing me, because um, it's a special honor to have Nafisa introduce us, because she's on detail from National Science Foundation. And I tell you, we are so thrilled to have Nafisa here and be able to provide that kind of a partnership from NSF, because this is an extremely important initiative. Much has already been said, so I don't want to do, uh, replicate that. I'll only add one more data point to what uh, Dr. Prabhakar mentioned, that Native American, Native Hawaiian, and Native Alaskan talent need to quadruple, in addition to Hispanic talent tripling, and you know, African American talent doubling, and women doubling. You know, this is something that the National Science Foundation's science engineering indicators clearly brought out. So I want to thank AAAS and Doris Duke, and most importantly, leadership of Alondra Nelson. You have been a champion of this for so long. So thank you so much for all that you do. And to thank you to OSTP for leading this initiative. So really appreciate that. So at NSF, I just want to say a few words about what we are prioritizing. It's very interesting, because at this moment, you will find that the Biden-Harris administration's priorities, the National Science Board 2030 vision, I happened to be on the board when we crafted this vision, and the National Science Foundation vision, vision are all perfectly aligned. When I came into the NSF two and a half years ago, we laid out the three pillars of what we want to advance into the future. And I will only talk about the central pillar, which is literally the central pillar, which is how do we ensure accessibility, inclusivity in all its forms. I traveled recently to many parts of the country with a congressional delegation, whether it is Mississippi or whether it's North Carolina. The other day I was in uh, Wake Tech in North Carolina, I will tell you folks, when I went there and I met these students, these are unbelievable talented people. There is no difference between them having worked in a university myself and guided PhD students and so on. These kids have it all. So it is our responsibility. It's our responsibility and we have to commit to this in terms of advancing this talent at full force and full scale. Dr. Prabhakar mentioned the missing millions. We need four million STEM talent very soon, and that, that STEM talent should be representative, as John Podesta said, of all the demographic of what we have all across our nation. Whether it is solving the climate challenge, whether as Brian said, in terms of addressing the economic, immediate economic opportunities. It's a right thing to do, it's a smart thing to do, and NSF is deeply, deeply committed to that. If you want to test that commitment, just look at the STEM equity and excellence fact sheet. We have a quiz at the end of the day. <laughs> so I would strongly encourage you to read this fact sheet because you will find in full force NSF's commitment. And I'm so grateful to President Biden and Vice President Harris for supporting strongly the science, the Chips and Science Act, because that investment is going to unleash the talent that is going to make possible, and this I talk wherever I go, innovation anywhere, and therefore opportunities everywhere. That's what we need in our nation. Innovation anywhere and opportunities everywhere. And we are going to make this possible as an agency 
that is principally responsible for advancing STEM talent all across the United States, whether it is the K-12 talent, community college talent, technical institute talent, four-year college talent, all forms of talent. And then, on top of that, how do we ensure that we provide the opportunities? There's a lot of industry presence here. How do we ensure that we have upskilling, reskilling, and make sure that these are not just thought of as a pipeline, but actually as pathways. You come in, you go out, you re-engage back in. So this is the kind of thing that the future of STEM talent is going to look like. And NSF is deeply committed to that. And I'm so excited. I've been told my time is running out. So <laughs> I'm watching it. I'm watching it. So I want to let you know that I'm so excited to see the different parties here. Academia, industry, foundations, government, everybody coming together. And that's what this takes. And so Sam, and you know, Sudeep, thank you so much for partnering with uh, Dr. Nelson and OSTP. And you can re be rest assured that NSF will partner, will help deliver, and make a commitment to ensuring that all talent everywhere across our nation will be energized, motivated, inspired, and brought to life. Thank you for the opportunity. His energy, it is amazing. <sighs> okay, I gotta rev it up here, okay. Um, so our first panel discussion is focused on navigating systematic inequality in STEM, and the panel will be moderated by Dr. Alondra Nelson. Our speakers, Lillian Martinez, CEO and Executive Director of OSTEM, Nicole Collins-Pori, CEO of TechBridge Girls, and Bonnie Suisse, Sweenor, uh, Director of John Hopkins University Disability Health Research Center. I invite our panelists to join us to the front of the room, and Dr. Nelson, the mic is yours. Welcome, welcome. Good morning. How do, it's good, there's a lot of energy, yes, colleagues, yes. Uh, yeah, to, to follow up on. So thank you all for being here. Um, wanted to start out with a conversation with these three great leaders because um, each of them are engaged in organizations and in initiatives and programs that look with really clear eyes at the barriers facing us and the STEM fields, and also in the face of that have come up with extremely innovative ways to think about um, how we would move forward to create a more equitable uh, and an excellent STEM ecosystem. So I wanted to just, we don't have a lot of time, we only got about 20 minutes, so let's get started. I wanted to talk to you about, uh, start with you, Nicole. Um, you uh, lead Tech, TechBridge Girls, um, which is very clear in its mission statement about the barriers, um, very clear about wanting to support girls, however they present themselves more particularly, um, and very clear that bias and discrimination is part of the terrain that girls are navigating, young women are navigating, um, but moreover have come up with extraordinary programs to, to, to deal with that. So I wanted you to, to talk about some of these distinct barriers, particularly the ones that are um, about various forms of intersectional identities and how those present in STEM communities, and then um, some of the work that you all have been doing. Over to you. Thank you, and thank you, Alondra, and thank you for having us. We, for 20 plus years, have been waiting for this conversation at a national scale. You know, we have been re-engineering STEM education because we know that it's not working for black, indigenous, and Latina girls, bottom line. And we also understand that it's systemic. Our girls are capable, ready, and willing to take on this STEM revolution, but we really need to look at the ecosystem as a whole to address it. So for us, what we've learned in this 20 years is that one size does not fit all. We often think about solutions as a one size fit all, but if you don't have the data and we're collecting and analyzing it, in ways that gets to the right solutions, we continue to perpetuate and leave students behind, especially our BIPOC girls. So for us, it's not always that the what is different, but it's about the how. How do we center the brilliance, the genius, the experiences, and the unique journeys of our girls as this narrative that is centered in the way that we present STEM? We also know that access is clear that not all programs are quality. 
So how do we create gender responsive, culturally relevant, supported by social emotional learning and development to ensure that our girls are getting quality STEM in their communities? Too often we talk about good STEM being in other places, but we have to invest and in scale in these quality programs that also are in our communities, but also that the out of school time workforce is being invested to. Our girls are only in school for 20% of the time. Out of school time has to be a critical partner, not only with programming, but the investment in the workforce so that they can sustain these quality programs in their communities. And lastly, belonging. So too often this, this conversation, I see all the heads shaking. Thank you, I have an amen in the corner uh, <laughs> moment. Thank you for, for affirming. Too often, this narrative has been centered on representation. Representation does not address the environments, the genius that is left behind when you're asking our girls to fit into a system that never wanted them in the first place. So we have to remember that we have to reimagine these environments so that our girls are centered in their own brilliance, centered in their own stories, created identities that reflect them and disrupts the dominant culture that tells us who and who cannot be in STEM and be successful in it. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> So at OSTP, for more than a, a year now, we have been uh, engaging various partners in industry and civil society um, a, a, a conversations about what's, what our barriers are and, and, and what works. Um, Nicole and her organization, all, the, all of the three organizations here have been organizations that we've been um, in conversation with. I want to turn next to you, Bonnie, if that's okay. Um, uh, we have certainly been illuminated by your research and your leadership um, in the space of thinking about the disability community in STEM and all of the kind of layers and levels of barriers um, and the, the challenge to us as a broader community um, to really make it possible for people to fully participate. So over to you and thank you. Yeah, well first, thank you so much for all the great work that you're doing and OSTP is doing on STEM equity and for including disability as part of this conversation. People with disabilities face many barriers to being included in and benefiting from STEM. But the two biggest barriers are ableism and a lack of accessibility. As a person with a disability myself, I can attest those are profound and pervasive threats to STEM equity. So ableism is the discrimination towards or the devaluing of disabled people. And ableism grips all of our society. But there's far too little understanding of that concept, of that type of bias, and even less focus on how to dismantle it. Structural ableism is baked into our policies, our procedures, our programs, and much of STEM really is still undergirded by ableist ideas, ideas that people with disabilities don't belong in STEM, an idea of belonging, that they aren't fit to lead efforts in STEM. But in addition, a lack of accessibility, which is a broad lack, really keeps people with disabilities out of STEM opportunity. Accessibility is all of our responsibility and should not just be reserved for people with disabilities. Ensuring that there's access and universal design of all of our spaces, places, education, data, and communication is a critical dimension of STEM equity. But the main approach to accessibility particularly in STEM, is that it's someone else's thing to worry about. And it's that not in my backyard approach to accessibility that just upholds the exclusion of people with disabilities. So that ableism and that lack of accessibility have really led to the exclusion of people with all types of disabilities from STEM. We're leaving a lot on the table. Although 27% of adults in the United States have a disability, only 
of science, engineering, and health doctorates have a disability. We have a long way to go. And for STEM professionals from additional underrepresented groups, particularly from underrepresented racial groups, that estimate's even lower. Multiply marginalized groups are even less represented. People with disabilities in STEM professions have higher unemployment rates than their colleagues, and that rate is higher than the U.S. national average. STEM professionals earn, on average, ten to fourteen thousand dollars per year less, and are less likely to be in STEM leadership roles. Clearly, we have work to do. Unfortunately, disability is not often part of these dis dis diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And I'm so grateful to President Biden's executive order on including that A at the end, the DEIA, A for accessibility, really to help draw in a focus of including people with disabilities, focusing on accessibility as well into these efforts. But unfortunately, that hasn't taken hold outside of federal spaces. I am really excited for this conversation and for these opportunities because I think there's a much promise and potential that people with disabilities can bring to STEM. Thank you, Bonnie. I want to just, if you'll hold on for just a second, I wanted to ask you to explain universal design because I'm not sure oh, that sure, people sure. understand that. And what are the implications of universal design or not having universal design for STEM classrooms, for STEM workplaces? Yeah, so universal design, you can simply think about it as designing for everyone, right? Designing to include the most number of people. And that certainly does include people with disabilities, but that can include across the range. It can include kids, it can include younger adults, it can, can include people who have just arrived to this country. And for classrooms and for STEM spaces, that really unlocks a lot of opportunity that currently isn't there for learning, for participation, and for benefiting from STEM. When we think from that design phase, that, that just how are we designing the spaces, the data, the communication strategies, with a focus on equity at that phase really is a critical dimension. Thank you so much for that. Lillian, let's turn to you. So we're delighted to have Lillian Martinez with us, who is the Executive Director for Out in STEM, or uh, Out in Science, Technology, Medicine, and, and Engineering, or uh, Engineering and Medicine, or OSTEM, um, to tell us about the work of this extraordinary chapter-based organization um, that you lead, um, and how you think about confronting barriers for LGBTQ plus communities in your work. Lillian, over to you. Thank you, Alondra. Thank you for having me and for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, so like other people in this table have mentioned, the LGBTQ community faces these multiply marginalized issues uh, and has been ostracized and found a very hostile environment in STEM through history. Um, I think the key difference is that students with other minoritized identities may benefit for access from access to their community and family support and LGBTQ youth and students experience a higher rate of homelessness and family rejection, which leads to a bigger gap in the pipeline coming into STEM and just getting into these roles. So the challenges along with the, like, a lack of resources pose barriers of entry in STEM. Once you are, if you manage to made it, make it and uh, get into a STEM field, you have to enter a space that has centered white, heteronormative, able-bodied uh, voices, and the issue is just compounded by multiply marginalized identities that many in our community have. You make it to school, and even in tolerant work environments, many try to separate your professional identity from your queer identity. We all talk about bringing your true self to work and being your whole self at work. And in a lot of STEM spaces, that is not the reality for LGBTQ plus people. Um, it's something that has to remain outside and it causes that people in the community feel like they have to leave their queerness at the door to really be successful in STEM. 
Thank you. Thanks very much. So I wanted to ask um, you all the same question and see what you would offer. So um, as I said at the beginning, you all do an extraordinary job of identifying the barriers that various of our communities face. Um, but I wanted to ask each of you for kind of one actionable thing that an institution or an organization can do um, to, to sort of break down barriers in STEM and to advance the equity and excellence um, in STEM that we're all so committed to. Well, I think one thing that we try to do at TechBridge Girls is take like an asset-based approach to our girls, right? So a lot of my conversation is about remembering the genius that we're leaving on the table and shifting the focus around the ecosystem and the adults that are actually part of the influence and the impact to our girls' trajectory. So for us, because we equip other out-of-school time educators to support and deliver our tech Bridge Girls programming, what we do is make sure that one thing that is kind of check how you show up and create space and hold space. I mean, I think everyone has to have a responsibility about how you are creating belonging, not only for your students or the folks that are in your workforce, but then how does your identity show up in that space of belonging? So for us, it's really about starting, one, with yourself, and how are you creating the space and understanding the identity that you bring in the space that can prevent or propel our girls or women, women of color, into these STEM spaces. Thank you. Bonnie? So I think one of the most important things is to ensure that disability perspectives are in your C-suite, are on your leadership teams. All issues are disability issues, and people with disabilities should be in all places decisions are being made. And I think by including disability perspectives in STEM decision making is going to have the most impact, is going to affect those critical points, those policies, those decisions that will then help shape um, the whole STEM ecosystem and help close the gaps. Thank you so much. Lillian. Um, one actionable thing. <laughs> That's hard. Uh, meaningful Just action. To start. I mean, we've yes. got a, a room of, a room of folks <laughs> Just here to one. working together to do this. And so let's, you know, put a few things on the table. We all are very aware we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. um, so you can't be what you can't see. Right. So representation, I think, is something we've heard about over and over, uh, visibility and starting there. Um, I think, and this could be a challenge to everyone, to redefine your definition of excellence. We are in the summit of excellence, and so much of the time, excellence has a very linear path. You expect the perfect GPA, the right pedigree, and people with multiply marginalized identities and people with different backgrounds and diverse backgrounds sometimes don't fit into that story and may be penalized because of their diverse experiences. So that is where I would start. Well, that is a good start for the morning. Thank you all so much for being here and for your uh, perspectives and for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your powerful perspectives and experiences with us. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Mariam Gulaid, and I'm a policy advisor at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Hanna El Samad. Dr. El Samad is a senior vice president and director of scientific integration, innovation, and insights at Altos Labs, where she is also a founding principal investigator. Prior to joining Altos Labs, Dr. El Samad was the Kuo Family Endowed Professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics and Deputy Director of the Cell Design Institute at the University of California, San Francisco. An accomplished scientific leader, she is also an advocate for an inclusive and eminent STEM ecosystem. Welcome, Dr. El Samad. Thank you for being here today. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am just absorbing and soaking the energy uh, in this room. Uh, 
it's uh, th thank you for involving me in this, and and uh, it's just it's just incredible to be here. So, it's been said many times since this morning. I'm going to say it again. There is no doubt that investment in STEM is the best hope we have for conquering the mounting health and environmental challenges facing our country and indeed the whole world. Solving these challenges will also need a serious effort in innovation. I am a scientist, I am also an engineer. My colleagues and I who dwell in the trenches of science and innovation have long known that a such a serious effort cannot be mounted without the mobilization, the nurturing, the promotion, and the empowerment. That's a critical word. Empowerment of the best and brightest across all populations of our United States. So for STEM to flourish in America, fulfilling the promise of a truly inclusive STEM education should absolutely be a priority. There's no question. In this promising future, a diverse workforce will be matched with equally diverse funding streams. Foundations in the room, please take note. <laughs> to pursue diverse, innovative ideas. And education and research will be done to fulfill the needs of all people and lift all people and the fruits of these endeavor should be equitably accessible to all people. This is something we haven't talked about yet. Accessibility to the fruits of science should be for all people. In this future, there will be no place for bias, discrimination, or harassment in our classrooms, in our laboratories, and in our companies. Systemic bias should be replaced with systemic purging of discriminatory practices, a focused and intentional effort built with an equitable structure that span the full education and science ecosystem. My colleague and I, who are, who as educators and mentors, see every day the immense, immense raw talent of all of America. We yearn for its fulfillment, we really do. Have long understood that the future of STEM should be shouldered by all of us, all of us. It is our collective responsibility by building coalitions across sectors, public and private, for-profit and non-profit, and by walking hand in hand towards an equitable and participatory future. A coherent and cohesive systemic change that leverages and continues the large grassroots efforts of the last few years. A coordinated and concerted national effort for STEM equity. It starts today, right? So for that, I am pleased, I am, I am honored to pass the podium back to Alondra who will share a vision for STEM equity and excellence, five pillars for transformation. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dr. El Samad, um, who's just been such an important uh, interlocutor for us uh, in this work. So you heard, we've heard powerful testimony this morning about the challenges people face in the STEM ecosystem. And I want to just briefly lay out the, the vision of the Biden-Harris administration for addressing these core challenges, some of which you've heard this morning, by tearing down institutional barriers that have long prevented the American innovation ecosystem for, from achieving its full potential. Last August, speaking at the signing, of the, the signing ceremony for the historic Chips and Science Act, President Biden laid out a mission statement for America's bold new science and technology investments. He said the following, in America, everything is possible. We can channel the full talents of all of our people into a greater measure of hope and opportunity for the nation and the world. Today, we're releasing a vision to drive this mission and to help the United States make good on this promise. 
We have spent over a year at OSTP engaged deeply with the American people. We have talked to everyone in this room about this work at least once, um, probably more than once, um, and, and lots of hundreds of other people besides. We've talked to students and teachers, workers in science and technology sectors, researchers, innovators, entrepreneurs, business leaders, education and university leaders, grassroots organizers, community scientists, federal STEM policymakers, and many, many others. So this vision, the five areas where we're calling for collective concerted action, is shaped by the conversation with all of them and all of you. I invite you to read the full vision on the OSTP website, which calls on organizations and leaders across the STEM ecosystem to take specific evidence-backed actions. So here are the five areas we're calling for bold action and for people to make commitments. First, we need to ensure that every person has the opportunity to participate in and contribute to science and technology throughout their lifetime. This means addressing structural barriers from early childhood to adolescence and increasing access to labs, to classrooms, and workplaces through universal human-centered design. It means building programs that are culturally relevant and including families, abuelas, aunties, churches, barbershops, and learning. It means support for the things that happen in the life of a scientist, like caregiving, caregiving and chronic illness, and mental health services. Second, we must invest in our vital STEM teacher pipeline. The STEM teacher shortage is disproportionately harming underrepresented students. We need to reduce the barriers that prevent individuals from entering and staying in the teacher workforce, make it easier for them to, learn the to earn the necessary certifications needed to teach science, mathematics, and computer science, and we need to give them the resources needed to foster innovation and experimentation in their classrooms. Let teachers teach. We need to make sure STEM teachers make a living wage and can pay off educational debt. We need to provide more resources to protect teachers' health, including mental health, and to support safe, inclusive, and equitable learning and teaching environments. So these environments where teachers work are environments where learners learn, and these need to be um, places that are safe and inclusive. And we need to create opportunities for professional lifelong learning. Third, we must close the funding gap and investment in communities, institutions, and people that have been historically excluded from access to STEM resources. Now is the time to provide resources to emerging institutions, minority-serving institutions, and community-based organizations. Now is the time to move from one-and-done interventions and invest in culture change over time with a focus on transformation and retention. Now is the time to expand opportunities for early career funding and holistic support for junior faculty and junior researchers. Now is the time to imagine funding community colleges, vocational schools, maker spaces, and mission-driven institutions at a level that drives institutions, innovation, and economic impact deep into the Midwest and rural communities and urban communities across the United States. And now is the time to facilitate connections between researchers and communities through citizen science and co-production of scientific knowledge. Fourth, we have to acknowledge and address the fact that the culture of science has too long tolerated outright abject bias and discrimination and dismantle it. Applicants should be able to see salary ranges and job descriptions shouldn't include gender, ableist, or ageist language from uh, language. Institutions should root out bias in performance evaluations, promotion decisions, and award and recognition selection. And all of us must reject rationale often provided for turning down women founders or founders of color that their venture is too early by driving capital to entrepreneurs from historically marginalized communities. Fifth and finally, and this has come up already this morning, all of this has, we must close the STEM information gaps. What do we mean by that? This means collecting clear, transparent, disaggregated data and information to understand what interventions work, which do not, and how to deliver more equitable outcomes. It means improving and coordinating data collection across the STEM ecosystem to develop shared indicators of progress towards STEM equity and excellence. And it means we must deploy analyses without reinforcing harmful practices like obscuring underrepresented communities and data. These goals are immense. They are not the work of one industry or one sector of society. It will take all of us working in tandem across fields to build this more equitable and excellent STEM ecosystem. 
So this is a call to action from the White House to the people and organizations assembled in this room and the leaders across the American science and technology ecosystem. The time has come to work boldly, with urgency, together, to open the doors of opportunity across each of these five action areas. This is a call to action to make this national vision a national reality. This is a call to action to meet President Biden's day one call to advance equity for people who've been historically excluded and leverage this once in a generation opportunity to power a more just and inclusive science and technology enterprise. This is the vision, this is the charge. I'm thrilled that in a moment we will hear from a distinguished group of people who are already leading the way on these action areas. Our next panel will speak to these promising practices and illuminate for us powerful interventions that are already advancing progress in each area of our national vision for STEM equity and excellence. This discussion will be moderated by my dear friend, the Undersecretary for Science and Research at the Smithsonian, Dr. Ellen Stofan. Ellen Stofan oversees the Smithsonian Science Research Centers as well as the National Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian and Libraries and Archives, and my favorite part of her portfolio, the National Zoo with the pandas. Um, uh, her focus is the Smithsonian's collective scientific initiatives and commitment to research across the institution. Previously, she was the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, where she was the first woman to hold that position. Dr. Stofan, over to you. Thank you, and I'd like to invite our panel to come up. Thank you. As they're coming up, I, I just want to uh, talk for a second about, uh, you know, this panel is going to be on talking about promising practices. And I know there are so many commitments coming forward today as part of this initiative that are so exciting. At the Smithsonian, we're particularly excited to be uh, talking about our Smithsonian Science Education Center, which has a partnership with the Defense Department focusing on uh, grades three through five technology education, around nine, mil uh, nine military bases, the rural communities around them. Our initiatives that we're working on to upskill teachers, we just heard Alondra talking about the work that's being done around teachers, which is so critical. And then two major initiatives of the secretaries around our shared future, reckoning with our racial past, and our shared future life on a sustainable planet where we're really thinking about how we bring in education, STEM education initiatives into that. So this idea of promising practices, which we'd like to focus on today, and I'm gonna start with Joaquin Tamayo, who's the Chief of Staff um, to the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Education. And obviously you're doing so much focused on STEM, really thinking about this issue of how we reach kids all around the country with the initiatives, and can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for, can you hear me? We're okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for having me here. And, and the Deputy Secretary sends her regrets. She was at the Orion Splashdown event in San Diego yesterday, uh, welcoming back um, the uh, unperson uh, craft with 800 young people and families in San Diego celebrating that historic milestone. Um, so she sends her apologies. She wasn't able to make it back in time for this event. So I'm happy to represent her and the department here. Um, what a great day, thank you so much. Thank you to my co-panelists uh, for being here as well. Um, what we did at the department starting last year um, was to, under the secretary uh, charged, the deputy secretary, to really understand from the ground up what was happening in our STEM classrooms, in our STEM spaces, what were the issues that the department could most productively address. So we took our time, we took about a year to really dive deep with the field, hundreds of conversations, engagements with field leaders, states, school districts and schools all across the country and young people themselves to really understand what were some catalytic moves that the department could make um, you know, pretty quickly, as quickly as possible so that we could see um, or we can move closer to STEM equity and excellence for all students. And what we heard loud and clear from all across the country is that we really have, or we're experiencing right now, particularly as we come out of the pandemic, a crisis of belonging in this country, a crisis of belonging in our classrooms, a crisis of belonging among our educators, um, and it's having a real uh, serious impact. 
Um, and so as we, we dug deep, in, again, to understand the role that the Department of Education could most productively play, um, we, we centered on, you know, we could really make um, some headway by addressing what it takes to ensure that all of our students from pre-K all the way through higher education can experience and benefit from, not just access. I think we, we talk a lot about access, but not enough about the benefit of that access. Um, benefit from rigorous, relevant, and joyful STEM learning. If the, if, the, if the young people told us themselves, if, if what we're learning is not something that inspires us, that gets us up in the morning, even with the challenges, it's not about making learning easy, it's about making learning worth it. Every single day that I show up to a classroom, I have to like it. It has to be joyful at the end of the day. Um, and so uh, really leaning into rigorous, relevant, and joyful education. When it came to teachers, STEM teachers you know, really um, felt like like, you know, they were, um, well, let me put it this way, about, uh, we're, we're onboarding about 25 or 30,000 STEM educators every single year, but we're losing many more than that every single year. So the math is inexorable in terms of the work of the STEM workforce um, that, that we're uh, supporting out in the country. So we really have to, I'm so glad it's aligned to the core pillar of this initiative, really have to figure out how we identify, develop, onboard, grow, and retain our STEM educators, including by improving their working conditions through equitable salaries for our STEM educators, but also in school working conditions where they are included in the overall sort of faculty approach, making sure they have time to plan, time to work with students, um, and that what we ask them to do is not an add-on onto their existing already really um, uh, challenging job. And then the other thing that we learned um, was that the investment in terms of STEM equity is not equitable. And, you know, and it really does depend. If you don't know, our educational, education system in this country is, is radically decentralized. And education really, despite the federal government's role, is a state and local matter. So we have to figure out how to empower and enable that radically decentralized ecosystem to really make sure they're investing not just strategically but sufficiently in our teaching and in our learning. And so through all of that, um, we were so happy um, to develop a new initiative that we just launched last week. So this is very, very timely. Um, last Wednesday at the department, the, the largest in-person gathering at the department since at least March of 2020, um, the first time the department has launched a major STEM initiative in well over a decade, um, and it's called, very simply, You Belong in STEM. And we're sending an unequivocal message <laughs> to, to say, thank you very much. You belong in STEM unequivocal message to our students and to our educators that no matter who or where you are, you belong in STEM. And we're leaning into the science of belonging. And so I hope, you know, after this, uh, after this uh, seminar or this summit, if you don't know much about the science of belonging, Google it, learn about the science of belonging. When young people and teachers, anybody, um, are, are enveloped in learning with environments that, that provide a sense of safety and belonging, the brain works better. They, people can devote their full brain power to the challenging coursework, the challenging work that STEM uh, entails. Um, so it's not just something that we're saying to be nice to people or because it sounds nice. The science of belonging, when we can help, help people feel like they belong in all the spaces where they're tackling really hard subjects, really hard concepts, challenging themselves, when they feel like they belong, cortisol is lowered, oxytocin is increased, and we can apply for the full brain power of our students to the work at hand. So we're really, really excited. We just kicked off um, our initiative, but very proud to announce that, again, we brought over uh, 250 leaders from across the country to, to the department and already um, have 175 commitments from organizations and entities across the country uh, uh, devoted to the goals of the You Belong in STEM initiative. Um, so the Department of Education is here, standing with our federal partners and the entire ecosystem. We're in it to win it um, with our, for our teachers and for our kids, um, and we're so glad to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now I want to introduce uh, Dr. Maria Klawi, uh, the first woman president of Harvey Mudd College. And, and Maria, we're talking about, you know, I, Nicole said something earlier about this idea that we have to reimagine what we're doing for success. And I feel like over your tenure at Harvey Mudd, when I'm, I'm learning about evidence-based programs that are working and making a difference, it comes back to Harvey Mudd. So can you talk about, about I know you're focused particularly on a computer science programs you're working on. Well, actually, we're focused on all STEM disciplines, but I will start. Oh, thank you. Um, 
So first of all, thank you for having me. And I'm gonna tell you the story of how Harvey Mudd College became one of the most diverse STEM institutions across every discipline in the world. I accepted the presidency at Mudd because I'm passionate about increasing diversity, both gender, sexual orientation, and race in STEM disciplines. And Mudd had a tradition of innovation in curriculum and pedagogy, and I knew that's what we needed to be able to shift. However, I hadn't realized that many at Mudd thought that the low numbers of women and people of color when I arrived were because Mudd was a rigorous, also relevant and vocal, <laughs> was a rigorous STEM institution. When I arrived in 2006, so it was my 17th year, 30% of the students were female, and under 30% of the students were BIPOC. Fortunately, Freeman Hrabowski, president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, gave an inspirational keynote at a MUD strategic planning workshop in the fall of my first year. And he talked about the success of the Meyerhoff program at UMBC in recruiting and retaining black students in STEM who went on to succeed in top PhD programs across the country. Freeman inspired our community to make unsurpassed excellence and diversity at all levels a key theme in our strategic plan. The unsurpassed excellence piece was to make it clear that we would maintain our intense level of rigor. And I will just say, uh, Harvey Mudd is a tiny institution, undergraduate only, it's in Claremont, California. It competes with Caltech and MIT and the Ivies for our students. And it is the most intense, rigorous undergraduate STEM education in this country. Computers, <laughs> bar none. Uh, come and try it if you don't believe me. <laughs> it's also relevant and joyful. Computer science was the first department to work on increasing the percentage of women in the major, which was about 10% when I arrived. At MUD, students don't declare majors until the end of the second year, and every student takes a class in every STEM discipline in the first three semesters. So you have a chance to recruit students from all who intended to major in all kinds of different things to any particular major. Computer science started by changing the intro course, separating it into sections based on prior experience, adding applications through the homework exercises, increasing student collaboration using pair programming, and providing more tutors during lab sessions. They also added early summer research and industry intern internships because research shows that those kinds of early experiences where you can show that you're using what you learned to do something worthwhile in the world, increase retention for women and people of color. They also took first year students to the Hopper Conference celebrating women in computing so they could see ro role models and diversified the speakers in the seminar series. At the same time, admissions, so this is for the whole college, increased the percentage of women in incoming classes. Within four years, the percentage of women majoring in computer science was 40%. And a couple of years later, it reached 50%. And over the next few years, other departments made similar changes and now we're roughly half female in every single major, including engineering and physics and math, everything. Well, now I want to talk about race because I got to tell you, solving the problem for women is really easy compared to sol solving the problem for Hispanic, Latinx, black students. So over the last 10 years, we have worked incredibly hard to increase the percentage of students of color. So we were at more than 70% white. We're now at about 27% white. Hispanic students are in the mid 20 percent. Students presenting as black in the last two years, over 15, one five percent. When I arrived, that number was under one percent. So students of color are now rep well represented in all of our majors and especially in computer science. And that's actually really important because computer science 
graduates earn unbelievably high salaries now. It's averaging between 120K and 150K. And I want to make sure that our students of color and our students from low, end back, low income backgrounds have those opportunities. We no longer have weed out courses at MUD where students are told, this is the class where you find out whether you belong in major X. We had those big time when I arrived. Instead, we start every intro class by telling the class that the course is challenging and that every student who works hard and asks for and takes help will succeed. That's really important <laughs> because STEM is challenging. It's rigorous, it's relevant, and you can make it joyful, but you have to work hard. We also continuously celebrate our cultural value that every person, every student, every faculty member, every staff member is responsible for the success of every other person. Just joyful. Thank you. <laughs> Now, Dr. Bernard Harris is the CEO of the National Math and Science Initiative, and I think it's safe to say that in this room, he's the only person who's ever taken his enthusiasm for STEM literally off of this planet. Um, so, Dr. Harris, can you talk to us about some of the? <laughs> sorry, can you talk to us about some of the promising practices that you're working on at NMSI and this importance? I think of really of of how do we form partnerships? How do we all work together? Thank you, Ellen, for that uh, shout out there. <laughs> um, you know, when I get introduced as an astronaut, I always remind people that when I was at NASA, I had a uh, extraterrestrial mission, which was to do whatever my bosses said at NASA uh, during the mission. And uh, that actually set the foundation for me to do my terrestrial mission now, which is ensuring that we have high quality education uh, particularly STEM education throughout the nation. So that was one of the reasons 15 years ago that I decided to um, join as a founding board member of the National Math and Science Initiative. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do my own shout out here and I'm joined by my chairman, chairwoman today, and that is Shirley, Dr. Shirley Malcolm of the AAAS. <laughs> And of course, everybody knows Shirley here, so <laughs> I have, I keep good company. And Dr. Nelson, thank you for the invitation. The National Math and Science Initiative, uh, as I said, has been around for uh, 15 years. I, I joined it because this organization does a lot throughout the nation, National Math and Science Initiative. And one of the things that uh, we want to do is stamp out uh, STEM deserts throughout the, throughout the country. And we do that primarily through our vision, through our mission, and through our programs. And so our vision, vision is to transform the face of STEM. And what I mean by that is that we want to transfer who uh, gets involved in STEM education, how uh, kids are educated at every level. And secondly, hopefully that will lead to jobs. So we talk a lot about workforce, so hopefully if we do our jobs right and we get that pipeline going, it's going to mean that we're going to have more people of color, uh, more women involved in STEM fields. Now, at the program, we, we uh, actually have three programs that we focus on at, at NIMSI, is what we call it. And the first is uh, advancing um, advanced uh, placement in high schools all across the country. And currently, we are in about 15 um, hundred school districts always always stop because I usually say uh, high schools, but no, districts that we're involved in. Uh, we also have a program that we call Laying the Foundation that uh, supports uh, STEM professional development for teachers. And then we are involved in, st in STEM and teacher preparation uh, too. So those are three core, core programs. And as I said before, we want to reach those uh, communities that are furthest from opportunity, that don't have the opportunity that we are all talking about, about this morning. Uh, about, uh, I guess, um, six months ago, we re redid our strategic plan. And so in doing that, we have sort of four pillars that we want to make sure uh, that will help us meet that vision. And the first one, it's about strengthening our core. 
we know that we have uh, been doing a pretty good job. Uh, when you look at our outcomes, uh, our kids not only uh, get through high school and graduate at higher rates, but going to college and matriculate through college at higher rates. So we want to do that better. Uh, given where we are in this nation, and we talked about the impact of uh, STEM uh, on the future, we want to make sure that we get kids more involved in those um, uh, math and science uh, courses, particularly uh, algebra, so we're focused on that. We want to transform uh, what's happening in teacher education, and so we want to take our, our, our laying the foundation to the next level. And then lastly, we want to, to make sure that we reach those target communities, black, brown, and indigenous populations, and so that's our focus. Excellent, thank you very much. Now, lightning round one action that an organization or an institution can do that's going to make a difference in this area. Joaquin, I'll start with you. I'll just say it again. Lean into the science of belonging. Understand what it takes to create the conditions where young people, where educators, or families feel like they belong, and you can have really powerful impacts on the policies that determine the contours of those environments, as well as the practices that our teachers and others are employing with young people. When we can, can, when we can connect the science with uh, practice and policy, I think we're gonna make a lot of headway uh, uh, on our short mission. Awesome, Maria. I'm just gonna build on that by saying, make sure that your courses build a sense of belonging right from the start. It doesn't matter whether it's a high school course or a middle school course or a higher education course, a college course or graduate school course. You want to send a message to your students, all of your students, that they belong and they're going to thrive. Amazing, Bernard. So I actually have two and I'm gonna cheat here because uh, Dr. Nelson has already talked about and that is convening organizations like they're in the room right now. Um, a few years ago, we had convenings where we went into different cities, and, and in doing so, we would invite them to receptions or dinners, and people were involved in education in those communities. And we were surprised that a lot of the folks that were, were invited didn't know each other, and they're in the same community. So this effort that we're doing with the summit is connecting us, and if we can be connected together, we can be more effective. And then the second thing is that we need to do something about the diversity in our educators, particularly um, minorities. So if you, if you now, um, you know, most recent study shows about 17% of teachers are actually uh, black or Hispanic, and you can divide that in half when you're, they're teaching in an environment that is mostly black and brown, you know, people of color. So we've got to change that, and that's what we plan to do. Awesome, thank you all, and thank you to Dr. Nelson for this opportunity for us all to speak today. Thank you. Bernard, Maria, Joaquin, and Ellen. Thank you so much to our panelists. It is now my pleasure to introduce Natasha Smith Walker. Natasha is the executive director of the Chicago based nonprofit organization, Project Exploration. As one of its leaders, she has worked tirelessly to ensure that there is access for girls, marginalized youth, and communities to high quality STEM programming. She has over 20 years of experience in youth development and education, focusing particularly on access to opportunities. And so she serves as a leader with her voice on national, excuse me, on national, um, on a national STEM ecosystem advisory council, as well as serving within her community in city and school district communities and work commu com committees and working groups. So Natasha, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, thank you. Um, this is such a great honor, so Dr. Nelson, thank you very much. I feel like everything I've heard across this morning is just connecting so many dots. So 
Thank you for the introduction. I do serve as the executive director to Project Exploration, a nonprofit STEM organization that actually was founded almost 25 years ago. So we've been working around pathways and transformative learning, and the sense of you belong in STEM is such a cornerstone of the work that we have done. Um, and so for us, we really do believe that this lifelong learning needs to happen when you start with young people, start with them young, and continue to nurture that. We also serve as the backbone organization to the Chicago STEM Pathways Cooperative, which is the Chicago STEM ecosystem that is charged with looking at STEM education across the city of Chicago. We're very grateful because though we are very focused on STEM education, we have many other networks that we connect with that also are looking at how do you connect learning across our city. Um, you're right, over my course of 25 years of working with communities, I really do support building connections for young people to empower them. My personal connection to STEM education was I actually started as a STEM-related field in, in college. And unfortunately, I found myself in a space that was not about me, and so therefore I did not persist. And in my work in project exploration, I strive to ensure that equity and access and opportunity for girls and minority youth and communities that gain access to this opportunity. At Project Exploration, we describe access as the right, hear me, the right to explore STEM in an authentic, relevant, and hands-on manner. For us, access encompasses quality in terms of, equality in terms of gender, race, class, economic status, and opportunity. And we do not look at academics as a need for you to be part of STEM. An, 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 an equitable and excellent STEM ecosystem has room for many STEM participants. Whether they are in school, there is a spirit of discovery that we all possess. There are jobs and careers and futures that require curiosity, but may not necessarily require a credential. What we've learned over the last two decades in creating a robust, equitable STEM ecosystem that support thriving, successful learners, educators, both informal and formal, and communities is not a job of one institution, but rather of many. So like the African proverb says, it takes a village, and here it takes all of us. It takes preschools, elementary schools, community colleges, minority-serving institutions, research centers, workforce training centers, programs, internships, museums, all of these make up the fabric of our ecosystems that we need to build together. We have led the work in the Chicago ecosystem. Some of our initiatives include STEM in the Shy, but one of our most important ones is STEAM ambassadors. How are we developing a future workforce? We need young people to start to look at individuals who reflect who they are and make sure that they are giving them the opportunity to look at themselves and belong in STEM, which is so valuable and so important in our workforce and in our education system. I applaud the administration for taking a strategy to really look at human capital, including educator shortages, and closing that funding gap. I am looking forward to NSF supporting some of the initiatives we put forth, because that's where the money, that's where the money put, you know, you put your money where your mouth is. So providing accountability and scaling coordinated and collaborative uh, ways at a national level is going to be so important and so valuable, and we are so grateful to be a part of this process, and we look forward to partnering with so many of you to make sure that every young person person who has an even inkling of wanting to be involved in STEM gets involved. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Natasha. And I should say, you know, again, that we've talked to many of you over the course of the more than a year we've been engaged in this conversation, and we learned so much from the Chicago land ecosystem. Um, and so, Natasha, thank you so much for representing that work that we hope to model and scale. Um, it's my great privilege now and pleasure to introduce Sam Gill, um, President and CEO of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Um, Sam is relatively new to this particular role in philanthropy and came to this role with an extraordinary extraordinary vision um, for partnership and for working across philanthropy, business, um, government, industry, uh, communities um, to really affect change in medicine and biomedicine and the community of culture of biomedicine and in STEM more broadly. Um, and he's been an incredible interlocutor in our work and partner. Uh, and Sam, over to you uh, for our next panel. Thanks very much, Dr. Nelson. I invite our panelists to, uh, to come to the stage. Um, and as they do, um, thank you again, Dr. Nelson, for, for hosting us uh, and for having us here. It's a real honor to have this conversation at the White House. I'm sure something extremely historic happened in this chair, and maybe we're continuing that tradition 
that tradition today. Um, as our panelists get settled, I, I want to say that um, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation is really honored, I think, to answer the challenge of the Biden-Harris administration. Um, and we're doing that today by announcing uh, with the American Association of, for the Advancement of Science the STEM Opportunity Alliance, which will really be the first whole of science effort dedicated to equity in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine fields. Um, <laughs> As, as Dr. Nelson uh, mentioned at the outset, this partnership is going to be powered by more than nine, 90 different organizations across all sectors who are committing $1.2 billion to advancing equity in science and technology across all sectors, all fields, and at all levels. And this is a fantastic start to what we're going to need to do to be able to solve this problem. I also wanted to, to announce that uh, we at Doris Duke and 12 other foundations are going to make sure that the STEM Opportunity Alliance gets off to a strong start by pledging $4 million here today uh, to support its initial operations. Um, and I want to quickly acknowledge them, uh, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Burroughs Welcome Fund, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the Heising Simons Foundation, the Henry Luce Foundation, the jo Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, the Lasker Foundation, Lida Hill Philanthropies, the Rita Allen Foundation, the Simons Foundation, the Spencer Foundation. Thank you all very much for standing up. So now we're going to hear from four incredible leaders who have been at the head of the charge for years on these issues and will help guide this movement. Um, we have Dr. Suda Perik, the CEO of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, April Arnzen, Senior Vice President and Chief People Officer at Micron, David Wilson, the President of Morgan State University, and Una King, the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at SNAP, Inc., and a member of the House of Lords. Uh, Sudip, I want to start with you. Tell us about the STEM Opportunity Alliance. Why is it important and what's it going to add to this important issue? Great. Thanks, Sam. Um, first, I want to thank you and Alondra. Uh, you all are uh, collaborators of the highest integrity and initiative and vision, and that, you can't ask for more. I uh, also want to thank our team at AAAS, which includes my thought partners, Travis York and Shirley Malcolm and Michael Feeder. Uh, I'm still learning from them. Um, look, this, I want to thank also our cross-sector partner, uh, cross partners, uh, everybody who's involved in making this day happen, because uh, the days like this don't come along very often. They don't come along very often. I want to get more to that. Uh, the AAAS has been working in this field for 50 years, mostly under the leadership of Shirley. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 she was a toddler. <laughs> Y'all think I'm joking. I'm not joking. Uh, she was a toddler. Um, but, you know, on the eve of our 175th anniversary, um, it, it, is, it is really powerful to say that seeing this group of people all gathered in a room, uh, folks from companies that start with numbers, uh, <laughs> chemical companies, pharmaceutical companies, companies that work in IT and in the wonderful world of social media. Uh, I wasn't joking. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, all, these, all these different spaces coming together with academia, with government. This is what it's going to take. This is what it's going to take. Because it's been described to me before that, um, that doing this is a long-term project. This is a long-term project. This is not something that you say you're going to do and then you walk away and it's done. It's something that requires uh, dedication and commitment. And it's been described in terms of this is, this is how you build the pyramids. This is how you build Stonehenge. This is how you build, this is how you build a cathedral. And I'm taking that from, uh, from Lady King, so I, I, I will uh, credit her for that. Uh, this, is, this is that kind of initiative. It takes that kind of work. And I'm confident with the people in this room that we're going to make that happen. Um, you know, in the coming months, the STEM Opportunity Alliance, which is this group that we put together, is about, <laughs> is about co-constructing. That is excitement. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of excitement we have in this room. Um, we're going to co-construct with the folks in this room who are part of this alliance, a national strategy. Because a plan beats no plan every time. Every time. A plan beats no plan every time. And we haven't had this ever uh, crossing all these sectors. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull that together and provide the transparency and accountability that's needed to understand and achieve real change. Uh, working together, we're going to take a significant step to ensure that we unlock our, our country's full potential. Because, look, this is an exciting time. Just today. Think about today. Today we're seeing an announcement about progress towards fusion energy, clean energy from fusion. 
Uh, think about the, uh, the announcements of new treatments for, uh, for diseases that are impacting our aging population and our young population. We're talking about cures. We never used to do that, and yet we're, we're talking about it. We're living in a time, living in a time when we can hear black holes colliding into each other tens of billions of light years away. This is an extraordinary time to be alive, and yet, and yet there are so many challenges in front of us. But with the group of people in this room, I'm confident that we're going to be able to pull on the, uh, the folks not just in, on the east and west coast of the United States, but also from the Mississippi Delta, the Central Valley of California, the Appalachia region, uh, all across this great land, uh, to get to the solutions that we're going to, that we're going to uh, need. Uh, so over the next year, uh, partners are going to host a slate of STEM community convenings across the country to co-construct this strategic plan. Uh, and there, our host partners include Arizona State University in Phoenix, Spelman and Southern Regional Education Board in Atlanta, the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, 3M in Minneapolis, Micron in Boise, the Simons Foundation Beyond 100K and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation in New York, and AAAS and Tiger Global Impact Ventures in Washington. What a remarkable group of hosts. That's just the hosts. And so I think that today really marks a turning point. I mean, have you ever been in a room at the start of something? The start of something big, the start of something important, the start of something that's gonna require dedication for years? That's what this is, that feeling that you got when you walked in the room, the shaking of the rafters, the, uh, the energy of the voices. That's what this feels like. And it feels like it because we have this moment, really a moment that was born of tragedy, a moment born of tragedy. But when we come together as a community, take that moment of tragedy and seize the opportunity that has arisen, we can make great change. We can make great change for the people of this country and frankly for the people of the world because the world needs us uh, in a way that I don't think it needs anybody else. It needs us. And uh, I'm so proud to be a part of this, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much. April, I know as a part of this, Micron is launching a major partnership to address some of these challenges around supporting and preparing teachers. Tell us a little bit about Micron's broader efforts to drive equity in science and technology and then how this new partnership fits into that. Yeah, great. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, Dr. Nelson, for bringing this incredible group of leaders together. Um, I'm excited to be, and I'm even more inspired now after listening to Sudip's words here. Um, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Micron, we're a semiconductor um, memory and storage manufacturer, the only U.S. memory manufacturer. And we are so excited about the Biden-Harris administration's focus on STEM, and of course, through the Chips and Science Act, we have the incredible opportunity to bring semiconductor manufacturing to the United States to make sure that the United States has a stable and secure supply of semiconductors. And I think in the pandemic, many of us learned that that was actually a thing, that, that <laughs> having a lack of stable supply of semiconductors, you couldn't go buy a car or a refrigerator. And, and so a lot of uh, disruption certainly occurred. And so we've got this great opportunity um, to bring these fantastic jobs to the United States, but they will, we will not be able to realize this opportunity if we don't expand the STEM pipeline and expand the STEM workforce. And we do not, at Micron, we do not want to miss this incredible opportunity to do this right and do this well and make sure we do this with equity in mind and reach every corner of the United States and make sure that students from underrepresented communities, rural communities, uh, girls, women, people of color, even our veterans have the opportunity to participate in these high paying careers. And so incredibly important that we focus on, on the STEM pipeline. And of course, the way we're thinking about it includes, you know, building more capacity at our four-year institutions, partnering with our community colleges and leveraging apprenticeship programs, but also thinking about K through 12. You can never start early enough. And so really um, enhancing our investment in our K through 12 programs and, and also taking it beyond education and training and, and thinking about the barriers that exist that are preventing people from going into these education and training programs or into these careers and you know things like childcare and transportation and housing 
and and we've been talking about another barrier uh, this morning, and that's really the lack of STEM educators. And we know at Micron, we know that that's an important barrier that we need to help remove as well. And so at Micron, we're doing many things already um, to increase the STEM educator pipeline, including taking our uh, semiconductor science camp that we deliver to kids. We're going out and teaching uh, rural educators who maybe don't have access to the curriculum um, and some of those advanced um, hands-on experiences to take to their classrooms. We're arming them with our curriculum that we teach to kids so that they can do it, they can be an extension of us. We're partnering with organizations like the Center for Black Education, Educator Development and Latinx Educator Collaborative to make sure we're investing in bringing more people of color into STEM education. We know that that is an important um, lever to make sure that we're retaining, attracting and retaining people of color, students of color, into the STEM pipeline. They need to see educators that look like them. Uh, there was a study in 2017 uh, done by a, a couple of universities that um, really highlighted the opportunity that we have when a black student has just one black teacher, dropout rates were cut by a third. That's, that's staggering, and so we've got, and that's just one black teacher. Um, and so we've got to make sure that our educator pipeline looks like the STEM pipeline that we're trying to create. Uh, we continue, of course, to partner with all of our incredible universities, include our HBCUs and our HSIs, and including great partners like Morgan State and Spelman, and Micron has invested over $2 million in HBCUs and, and HSIs, and we'll continue to do, to do that. Um, and we're also investing in educators that are um, helping our veterans transition out of military service into these STEM careers. So really thinking about it holistically. But today I'm really excited to share um, that Micro, the Micron Foundation will commit, uh, Natasha talk about putting money where your mouth is, uh, the Micron Foundation will commit $5 million uh, in partnership with the NSF to invest in our STEM educator pipeline and making sure. <laughs> and of course, NSF will provide matching. So collectively, that's a $10 million investment in our STEM educator pipeline and making sure, yes, thank you, Ponch isn't here anymore, but yes. Uh, making sure that that STEM pipeline or that educator pipeline really does look like America and really does help us serve the students and the adult learners that we're trying to serve to make sure that this STEM expansion is truly equitable. So we're thrilled to be here, thrilled to be part of the Alliance and we can't wait to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Tremendous, thank you so much April. David, historically black colleges and universities have, of course, a unique perspective on this set of challenges. Talk about the role of HBCUs, but also talk about what's gonna have to happen across all of higher ed to dismantle barriers, to overcome unacceptable outcomes, and to combat bias. Uh, thank you very much, Sam, and let me follow others in uh, thanking everyone for pulling together uh, this very timely conversation. I do think that we as a nation are at a point where um, we need to think seriously about national competitiveness, uh, national security, and in the area of STEM and the lack of representation, uh, equity, uh, and success in these fields, one can argue, uh, it really is challenging all of those. So this is very timely. Uh, first, as I look out on the audience, I see one other of my HBCU presidential colleagues present, Larry Robinson, the president of Florida A&M University. I want to acknowledge President Robinson. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, many of you think that... Oh, uh, oh uh, President Z. Scott, I didn't see you. Yeah, they're right there, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you, thank you, President Scott. Uh, and um, 
just to let the record reflect that we at Morgan State own a little bit of Shirley Malcolm as well. <laughs> <laughs> she is our, she, she, she certainly is my Yoda and um, uh, Sage um, advisor. Uh, she is a member of our board. She chairs the Finance and Facilities Committee. And so uh, she has a way of ensuring that the money is being invested in the STEM fields and areas where it should. So, um, uh, Sam, uh, in direct response to your question, so uh, let me just take uh, no more than 90 seconds to give you a sense of my background and then say a word or two about the very strong value proposition at Morgan and then equally the incredible value proposition of HBCUs. So um, I happen uh, to think that I've been around the horn in higher ed. Um, I was uh, the former chancellor within the University of Wisconsin system before I came to Morgan and oversaw uh, 13 of their freshman, sophomore, liberal arts campuses uh, there. Uh, but before that, I was a long time serving vice president at Auburn a University in Alabama and also was an associate provost there. And then before that was an associate provost at Rutgers in New Jersey. So I kind of spent my time in the TWI space in Harriet finishing up my career at Morgan, um, actually in my 13th year as president, undergraduate degree from Tuskegee, uh, and then two graduate degrees from Harvard. So, um, a little bit about Morgan. Uh, we are an institution of roughly 9,300 students coming from 45 states and about 60 countries. We have a very, very strong value proposition at that institution. Uh, we are number one in the state of Maryland uh, in about 10 areas um, in terms of the production of African-American graduates and number one in the state of Maryland in the production of blacks in STEM fields in engineering and in the sciences. We're number one in electrical engineering. We're number one in civil engineering. We're number one in industrial engineering and in the top in terms of producing blacks in the other science fields, in chemistry, in biology, and physics. In the nation, just one of those data points, we are number one in the United States of America in producing blacks in electrical engineering. We're number one in civil engineering and number two in industrial engineering. And so what I like to say is that just based on what I am seeing at Morgan is that we can't have any kind of serious conversation in Maryland about producing a diverse STEM workforce if Morgan is not just in the conversation, but close to leading the conversation. Uh, the second, and I have been uh, in and out of the campus here uh, for uh, a number of years. And I say the same thing nationally to the Department of Education, to the National Science Foundation. Um, don't look at HBCUs uh, as an appendage to this issue. Uh, we should be right there at the center of the discussion. <laughs> and so, so I like to call um, HBCUs um, the powerful, impactful, transformational three percenters. We only represent 3% of all of higher ed institutions, but um, we produce over a third of all of the STEM graduates who are black in this country. There are only 14 accredited ABET schools of engineering in the United States out of perhaps 1,400, I mean, uh, 14, 400, I'm sorry, uh, a better accredited uh, schools. Those 14 at HBCUs are producing, depending on uh, whose data set you're looking at, anywhere from 25 to 35 percent of all black engineers. Um, and so let me conclude by saying, well, why do you think that's the case? Uh, what in the heck is going on at these institutions? I can just say ditto, ditto, ditto to everything that has already been said. Um, I was asked uh, to make a presentation to uh, the Aspen Institute uh, this summer, uh, <laughs> and, um, and I just want to repeat a couple of things that I said there, because they also were grappling with the same question. 
Here's what I have learned in my 12 and a half years at Morgan versus all of my other time at these other incredible institutions. Number one, um, HBCUs played a long game. Uh, when the students arrive as freshmen, they are told at that point, you are going to graduate. And we are here to help you do that. And so it's not designed to weed students out. It is to embrace them, bring them in, and help them realize their true brilliance. Number two, there's a strong sense of community at HBCUs. There's a strong sense of belonging at HBCUs. And so um, there's a book that was written a few years ago called Band with Recovery by Sh Shia uh, Kasheldon. And she made a compelling point. It was that many black students, many poor students, many first generation college going students, they arrive at campuses and many of them have lost a bit of their cognition of their bandwidth due to racism, sexism, marginalization, and poverty. What I found at Morgan is that first of all, the institution restores a great amount of what has been lost. And then they do that on a foundation of caring, on a foundation of belonging, in a community that believes in them. And the last is that there's a very diverse faculty at Morgan. Um, about 50% of our faculty is black, about 25% white, um, and the rest are international. The fact they support each other, uh, it, we have some great scholars uh, at uh, Morgan. Um, there is no competition there. It's a really, really supportive community. And I would um, say that, um, as Dr. Malcolm has heard me say numerous times, and uh, President Robinson as well, only because we are the, um, the two high research HBCUs in the room, um, the nation will have lost a critical moment uh, if by the end of this decade we do not have a few HBCUs as R1 very high research institutions on the penthouse floor of research in this country. That opportunity presents itself and we have to take advantage of it. There are 10 of us now, 10 of us that are R2, very high, I mean high research. There is no HBCU in the country that is very high research. I think that's a sad commentary. And I think elevating, I hope elevating this conversation to these hallowed walls on this incredible historic place uh, will change that. So thank you. Thank you, great challenge, thank you very much. Thank you for that challenge. Uh, Una. Um, you come from a, a part of the, of, the, of the economy that really symbolizes, I think, to a lot of people, the cutting edge of innovation. So tell us what tech is doing and needs to do to address these issues. Well, first of all, thank you, Sam. Um, th isn't it amazing to be in the room where it happened? Hello. <laughs> As uh, <laughs> it was saying, you know, something is happening here today, and many people have waited actually decades for this to happen. This is, I mean, maybe I don't get out enough, but this is the most <laughs> exciting meeting I have been to in the last 10 years. So come on, people. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to give you a perspective of um, those of us inside tech um, who are tasked with solving uh, the problem around DEI, diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion. Um, and I say the problem is this. We can put a man on the moon but we cannot hire women into our tech orgs at the rates we should, or people from underrepresented groups, whether racial and ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, LGBTQ+, um, the list goes on, veterans, uh, and so forth. Um, so the problem is that the tech workforce, as we know, does not reflect the American people. 
we understand that's the problem. We can do all these things. We can create, you know, cars that can virtually fly, yet we have not been able to redesign our HR processes and our thought processes, I should say, to actually deliver a representative workforce. Now, workforce isn't the only thing. That's what I've been asked to touch on today. But I, I want to be clear. Obviously, it is a tripartite. It, it's it's workforce and that you need a representative workforce you need an inclusive culture to keep people once they arrive and you need an inclusive product and that is so critical uh, as we look at the 21st century and those three together actually create tech's dna which is either welcoming or not inclusive or not creates a sense of belonging or not and that tech DNA distributes life chances today. And you know, that is for real. I mean, today algorithms already decide if you get a job interview, if you get a bank loan, even if you get parole from jail. So this is truly about life chances. Um, so how do we change uh, tech's DNA? I, I wanna be clear that there are two important reality checks Okay, and the first one is that tech cannot solve this problem alone. Tech companies will never solve this problem alone. I'm not saying we're not gonna try very hard, <laughs> but it's not gonna work because we need to act holistically. We need to bring in, um, we need to work in partnership with government, uh, with the voluntary sector, with the philanthropic sector. Together, we can find the answers to this problem. That's the first thing. The second thing, our goal must be systemic change. You've heard that today. Everyone's spoken about systemic change. But here's the thing. If you want systemic change, you have to influence the most foundational system of all, and that is our education system. You've heard it said, but actually, if you look at all the policies of all of us, I don't think we're putting enough early intervention in that area. Uh, if we were, the outcomes would be different. So if we want our tech industry, if we want our tech industry's workforce to be more representative, our education system must be more equitable. Mm -hmm. That is all there is to it. Um, and otherwise, there's no foundation for bridging, for bridging, I nearly said Bridgerton. <laughs> <laughs> And we do want more representation in media as well, could I say. <laughs> but leaving Bridgerton to one side for a minute, uh, if, if we don't do this, there is no foundation for bridging the digital divide, for bridging social mobility, no foundation for social mobility. And think about that, what that means for a minute. That means no foundation for the American dream. So of course there is bipartisan support, as there should be, not just here, but across the nation as well. There is support for us to be urgent, for us to take action, for us to have a plan. Um, and I just, I, I wanted to mention um, that this lack of educational equity, I see it every day in my son's public uh, elementary school. He's got great teachers, they're working so hard, but frankly they've got no money. They've got no money. Um, I got a, a, a message asking for a financial donation. I know they have, they have asp aspirations in the STEM space. So I thought, oh, this is going to be asking for, you know, something to buy IT equipment. No, it was asking to help buy a mat for the children to sit on. Now, if these children do not have a mat to sit on in first grade, I can tell you they will not have computer science centers with you know, qualified CS teachers, as we've been hearing about, in fifth grade, eighth grade, 10th grade. That's just facts, okay? So I really want us, tech companies especially, to think about how could we come together on that around education equity because we have to solve some of the foundational problems so we can get traction. Now, I'm going to try and keep to the script one minute left, okay? Um, I wanted to quote the ACT report because we got 30, uh, over 30, um, influential tech companies to sign up to this. Um, and the ACT report says um, that, put simply, <laughs> tech companies poach each other's talent from underrepresented groups. It's the HR equivalent of rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. 
It's why so many DEI efforts sink without trace. They are a zero-sum game. We're all trying to win on our own separately, but we're only failing separately. We can only win together. We must come together. And of course, there's other work to be done. Of course, our companies must take responsible um, you know, for changing our cultures, for rooting out biases, um, and for changing our systems. But a fundamental problem is that only a small group of children in America today receive the education they need to get a career in tech. So, you know, we can spend all the time in the world focusing, as we often do, on that small number of recent grads from underrepresented groups or the equally small fraction of underrepresented groups who've already got a job in tech. Oh, you can come in. You've already had a job at Apple. You've already had a job at Google. Oh, we can find room for you. No, it's not good enough. It's got to change. Um, so, what this group of experts uh, concluded is, you know, we asked them many questions. One of them was, um, what is the one thing that would do more to open up computer science education to underrepresented groups more than anything else? And they said, eighth grade algebra. Now, you all know that. You all know that, I'm sure. But here's the kicker. Most schools in America where you have BIPOC kids and you have African American, Hispanic, and other kids from underrepresented groups, they are at schools that do not even offer eighth grade algebra. That is the classic definition of a systemic barrier. You, it literally, the system is designed to not even offer you the chance, okay? So we have to change that. And you heard about how we've got to put, put all those things together. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to say, you know, is if I go to a tech CEO and say, hey, it's your job to fix eighth grade algebra, uh, they, they think I'm nuts right? Um, but actually, I did say that to my CEO, uh, to be fair. <laughs> and he said, uh, okay, how can we contribute? And a lot of other tech CEOs, if you give them a clear path forward, they will come on board. If you show that the majority of people who've been working in this area, who have evidence-based programs to, to make change, they will come on board. So let's um, do that together. In summary, systemic problems require systemic solutions, and if we change tech's DNA, that is how we will change tech's workforce for the future. Thank you. Please join me in thanking this incredible group of leaders for speaking to us tonight. Thank you for that truly energizing panel. Um, as we approach the end of our program, I'm pleased to introduce Zach Oxendine. As you will hear from Zach, Zach embodies the combined transformative power of STEM equity and excellence in his personal journey and in, in his continued work to uplift his communities. Thank you for joining us, Zach. The mic is yours. Y'all, uh, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> this is, I'm so optimistic. Everybody that spoke today, the people that are in the room, it really, uh, it fires me up truly, uh, you know, to see what the moment that we're having because this is really gonna make a difference. So thank you all for being here today. I'm excited to join you for the White House Summit on STEM equity and excellence. And I want to specifically thank the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy and AAAS for inviting me to join you as we seek to achieve a more equitable, diverse, and inclusive STEM ecosystem for all people. My name is Zach Oxendon. I was born and raised in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I am also a member of the Lumbee Tribe. Today I work at Microsoft where I've been able to build and support Azure Cloud Services. But my career path has been anything but traditional, and I want to share it with you. I am the son of deaf parents and one of seven siblings. My parents divorced while I was in elementary school, which made these challenges even tougher. I often found myself in trouble at school, and although I was deemed a bright kid by test scores and honor classes, my grades did not reflect that potential. For me, school was not a place where I always felt like I could be empowered to be my authentic self. 
it seemed like I didn't fit the idea of what success could look like. And instead, I was often dismissed by teachers, peers, and parents as nothing more but having potential but a troubled, poor kid. I had a few believers, though, and those believers fed my energy to continue aiming high. In sixth grade, I was selected for a talent identification program for kids with high standardized test scores. It was a great opportunity. I remember being so excited, but my hopes were crushed when it was made clear that the programs were too expensive for my family. I started to come into my own during high school. I got involved in theater, funny enough, sports. I was in a debate club. I was editor on a school magazine, entrepreneur club. I started a t-shirt company and I even took AP classes. I was searching for something that would enable me to make the largest impact on the people and the issues I care about. Still, college seemed to be out of reach, not only because of the price tag, but also because I couldn't imagine myself as anything other than a local kid limited by circumstances. So with the wisdom of my family, my loved ones, they pushed me to join the Air Force. I decided if I was gonna ever overcome the challenges and the obstacles that I was facing, that the military would serve me well. The decision to join the Air Force granted me the opportunity to work in cyber, and I've never looked back. I went on to win Airman of the Year in my squadron in 2017, and then made Staff Sergeant. I realized that the field of technology would be my door to making the impact I desired while doing something that was just fun. After completing my associates in IT, I decided I wanted to pursue a four-year degree and I transitioned from active duty to enter the reserves and work at Best Buy Geek Squad so that I could support myself <laughs> through my first semester of college. Two things happened. I realized that a four-year program was not a sustainable model for me, and I won Geek Squad's Agent of the Year at my store. <laughs> if you bought a Geek Squad service in 2019 on Harbison in Columbia, South Carolina, <laughs> chances are I sold it to you. My mentors impressed upon me that I could work for Microsoft one day, and that became my dream. I took an IT job at a defense contractor, and I applied multiple times to Microsoft. After each interview, I chose not to be discouraged when I was turned down, but rather to become more determined to skill myself both on the job and through certifications. I also implemented a networking strategy on LinkedIn, and by doing that, I found and landed the role of engineer at Microsoft. Seeing the limited representation our indigenous community has in our sector, I felt like I needed to do more. You see, too many kids like me, they don't have the opportunity or the supports to access and thrive in STEM. And STEM pathways are far too often blocked for too many of America's youth. To support more people with these opportunities, I built a STEM camp for Native Americans from the Southeast, especially my Lumbee people and my Catawba neighbors. I did this by convincing professionals, companies to volunteer and sponsor our camp. People who came from communities just like mine and allies who understood how important this, this work is. At our last STEM camp, we had more than 35 native high school and college students representing over five tribes coming together to engage in hands-on STEM activities with partners, industry, the government, and volunteers aimed at building, and we did it right here in Washington, D.C. At the camp, these young people built their STEM understanding, their aspirations, and their network of mentors for future opportunities. I've been honored through a Microsoft pilot program to help build curriculum, assist faculty, and mentor students at Turtle Mountain Community College in North Dakota, a tribal two-year school for the Chippewa Nation. This program aims to close workforce gaps in cybersecurity while reconstructing equitable talent pathways. This works because I am Indian. You see, when kids can see champions like themselves, the messaging means that much more. For me, real success has always been about what can I do with what I have been given. But it is so important not to act as if you have all the answers. You don't, or the perfect solutions to sell. You probably don't. Instead, really value the input of others. Collaborate with the understanding that you can learn just as much as you can provide. I will continue to build on my work for community colleges, indigenous and rural communities, cybersecurity, and really build bridges so that every person feels empowered to participate in STEM and thereby make the work that we all do work for all. 
That's exactly what we're trying to do with today's launch of the STEM Opportunity Alliance. And I am fired up to see how we can build on this momentum. Thank y'all. Right. What a hard act to follow. We are gonna we are gonna leave this morning as we came in, fired up and galvanized around this work. Zach, thank you for being you, thank you for taking time to share your story with all of us. You are clearly an extraordinary person and what you've been able to accomplish has been in part because of your, your extraordinary. But I'm also gonna say it shouldn't be that hard and all of us in this room, it is incumbent upon us to make it easier, to provide the on-ramps that young people need, that workers need, that veterans need, that people in rural communities need to do, um, to have the STEM journeys that they wanna have. Um, so let me just, let us just wrap up. I hope when, that we've, um, I hope when we've made progress in our work that we're embarking upon today, that every young person will look upon the world as Zach does, um, and not see it for its limits, but for its abundance. I hope that our future innovators will not be unencumbered, will not be encumbered by the weight of an unequal past, but be, will be buoyed by a boundless future. And that when these young people dream of a life in science and innovation, that they will see well-trodden pathways to get them there. That is the work and the vision of the Biden-Harris administration, a vision this uh, day has affirmed with so many um, and that we share with so many of you. This vision includes a STEM workforce that reflects all of us from the classroom to the boardroom to the manufacturing center to the operating room to the laboratory, communities that are engaged in the everyday work of science and discovery, an approach to innovation that is rooted in inclusion, integrity, our common humanity, Imagine all of us building that future together, making bold leaps to embed science and technology into the fabric of our communities across the bow of silos and aggregated at a grander scale than ever before. We can imagine this because we have before us an extraordinary window of opportunity, a moment of promise and possibility, a chance to write a new social contract, not just for this moment, but for the decades and generations ahead. I thank you each and every one for the role that you're playing in this work. I'm grateful to every person across the country who spoke to us, who sent ideas, strategy, shared studies, experiences, stories to help inform this vision over our last year, more than a year of engagement. Thank you to our visionary colleagues, Sudip Parikh, Sam Gill, and their extraordinary teams at AAAS and Doris Duke for their hard work and partnership to get us here and the leadership they have committed to, uh, to sustaining well into the future. Thank you to our colleagues across the federal government, including the Committee on STEM Education, and across every agency who has come forward to commit to transformative work. Thank you to my colleagues at OSTP and our science and society team for leading this historic initiative with brilliance, boldness, and conviction, and tenacity. Thank you all for being here today, and we look forward to the work ahead. Congratulations to the STEM Opportunity Alliance, and we look forward to your leadership and seeing what you do next. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.